Good morning to all of the EAB University attendees. My name is Robin Osborne, and I'm coming to you live from Michigan State University. Along with my EAB University colleagues, Amy Stone from Ohio State University and Adam Witte from Purdue University, we welcome you today to this presentation by Dr. Cliff Sadoff, Purdue University entomologist and EAB researcher. Some of you may remember Dr. Sadoff from other EAB, EAB University presentations. And today he's bringing us his extensive knowledge of all things emerald ash borer to help dispel some of the misinformation that has been circulating about EAB management practices and set the record straight. Before we get started, I want to remind you that your comments and questions are welcome today. Please feel free to type them into the chat pod on the left of your screen and we will make a note of them. Cliff will be responding to these questions after his presentation to help keep the flow of the webinar smooth. We also appreciate any feedback you can give us because this helps us keep these free webinars coming. So please stay tuned until the end when we will be providing a link to a survey that we hope you'll take the time to fill out. For those of you needing CEUs, we will also need this information um, to help process those CEUs. We will be sending out a EAB goodie bag to the first 10 people who fill out the survey. But even if you've received a goodie bag in the past, we hope you'll provide us feedback on this webinar as well. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing in the next couple of days at www.emeraldashborer.info. You will also find the recordings for all previous EAB University webinars there. Thank you for attending today. We hope you're ready to learn a lot from this presentation. And with that, welcome Cliff, and we'll get started. Okay, Cliff, I don't know if your audio is on, but you need to turn on your little microphone. Okay. Yep. Uh, it was on. It was on before. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Yep. Great. <laughs> All right. Um, well, today, uh, you know, we we're talking about myths, and I just always think about urban legends, especially around Halloween, with these horrible, scary, spooky stories. So I just thought I'd start off my my talk with the uh, myth of the alligator in the sewers, which I do believe is is a myth. But uh, what I want to do today is 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 talk about uh, some of the issues uh, associated with, with emerald ash borer that, that, that have been really troubling. You know, we've been, we've been working with emerald ash borer for a long period of time, keep on seeing uh, people making the same mistakes over and over again, and it'd be nice to have an opportunity to try and uh, set the record straight so we could sort of uh, uh, reduce the chance of having uh, people uh, make these kinds of mistakes. So as you can see, I have a list of myths that I'm going to address today. And the first myth that I want to talk about is the myth that people think, well, this, this can't happen to me. My ash tree won't be affected. Well, um, the reality of it is, is that untreated ash trees really can't escape from emerald ash borer. And here's a slide that uh, our colleague, Dr. Dan Herms, put together of a street in Toledo, Ohio, in June of 2006, and here's a, on the, that's on the left. That's a nice uh, a street line, tree line street. And then uh, to the right is what that street looked like in August of 2009. And uh, I'll just I just want to help you at least to how to identify the ash trees in the pictures on the on the right. Uh, on the right, the dead trees are the ash trees, and the uh, living tree is a maple off in, in into the background. So, you know, the reality of it is is that when the emerald ash borer comes into a city, every single ash tree that is planted is going to be killed. Okay, these are there's no resistance uh, among these trees, but but they are all going to die. So, uh, so you have to realize that it is that the storm is coming and something will happen and you're going to have to plan accordingly for it. All right, so um, the reason the ash trees die is, you know, this is just a real quick review, is that, uh, okay, can you see my my pointer or not? Okay, uh, I'm gonna, can people see my pointer as it moves around? Can somebody chime in? The uh, pointer, your 
pointer no. would up, okay. be well, up then... um, above the button. Uh, above the screen? Um, draw. Yeah, you see the word draw, there's a button for draw, and then there's an arrow there. And that's your... Okay, good. That is your... Oh, screen. good. Now you got it. Oh, good. Okay. Well, that's good. <laughs> All right. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So, so as you can tell, that the emerald ash borer kills trees because it it feeds. Whoa, my goodness, it feeds uh, in 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 this uh, cambium and phloem area. And and what 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 happens is as as it damages uh, the sapwood and such, it it basically just kills. Uh, it reduces the potential of the uh, tree to uh, translocate nutrients and uh, basically just kill just kills it. So by destroying the vascular system, the tree basically is killed. And uh, the life cycle is uh, you know uh, is one generation a year. Uh, I think I'll start in um, in oh, this point is driving me nuts. Okay. There we go. Okay, so starting in in May, what happens is, uh, you know, they they will they will leave uh, the tree. They will mate, uh, feed on the leaves for a while in in July, June, and then they'll lay eggs in July. The eggs will hatch into these larvae that that do the damage, and then eventually uh, they'll, uh, you know, they they will uh, pupate uh, just beneath the bark, which is kind of where they are right now, and get ready to start the whole cycle all over again. So, you know, the reason these things are damaging is because they are really are boring insects that just destroy the vascular system, and there really is no escape. But that said, you know, we now know, you know, uh, 12 years after this thing has, has arrived, we now have developed some nice ways to protect trees. So the myth that the trees cannot be protected is definitely false. Uh, we've got a number of insecticides. We've got uh, neonicotinoids, okay, uh, which uh, the uh, most prominent being imidacloprid and dinotefuran. Uh, these are products that are available from a number of companies uh, that work quite well. At controlling emerald ash borer, we've got avermectin, uh, avermectins, which uh, are the, the, the generic name is emamectin benzoate. It's sold as two products now: triage and avermectin. Uh, these are can be used as injections. And then we have uh, an insect growth regulator uh, called azadiract, uh, azadiractin, uh, called uh, triazin, which also works. Uh, quite well uh, for protecting ash trees. And what I'm going to do in the next couple of slides is tell you, uh, give you the information that, that we use to, to convince us that these things actually work. Uh, but uh, I'll tell you a little bit about, before I do that, I'll tell you a little bit about the, the, the differences between this, these products. Okay, so I'm going to start with, uh, with, with imidacloprid. And um, imidacloprid uh, can be applied uh, uh, to the soil uh, in the spring, uh, uh, soon after the uh, buds, uh, you know, the leaves start breaking bud, to about mid-May, uh, and then again in the fall to October. And, um, you know, it's effective on trees up to 20 inches in diameter, okay? Um, and, uh, di and, and so this is a, a common, this, you can buy this product in, in, in stores. Uh, I was actually in the store the other day and I saw a quart of the product for four dollars on sale, <laughs> and that's enough to treat a ten a ten inch tree. Normally, it's about fifteen or twenty dollars for that, so it's quite reasonable, and you can protect them if you start putting your insecticide in there early. A second product is Dinotefurans called Safari or Zytec. Uh, it can be applied a little bit later in the year because it has a little bit of uh, uh, it's more water soluble. Uh, and you can uh, inject it into the soil or you can put it onto the trunk in, of the tree and it can protect trees up to 25 inches in diameter. Okay, And both of these neonicotinoid products uh, have got uh, restrictions on the amount of, of trees that you can, uh, the amount of product you can put into the soil per acre. Um, and But but these products are, are quite effective and, and usually that uh, a limitation is not a problem for, for an individual homeowner. Then, uh, as we start talking about these other products, which are only done by professionals, these are done by by injections. Uh, this is uh, emamectin benzoate. Uh, there's really no size restriction because you know, we have studies that we're going we're working with right now up to uh, four foot wide trees. That means uh, the diameter of the trunks of some of these trees are four feet, and we're getting uh, really good control with these products. Uh, 
the product lasts for uh, several years, and I'll talk more about that a little bit later. Uh, most recently, um, uh, the the newest product that that's that we're talking about is Azadiractin. Uh This is an OMRI approved, okay, organic uh, approved product. Uh, it works very differently than the other products, but uh, if it's applied uh, annually, uh, when the uh, product when the emerald ash borer populations are building and when it's peaking, uh, excuse me, if it's, it's applied every other year when the populations are building and then annually during the peak, uh, you can get some very good control of this as well, uh, with this product as well. So uh, there's some differences in how these products work. Uh, Imidacloprid, Okay, you know, n none of the products kill the eggs, but the imidacloprid kills uh, the, the young larvae, and uh, it kills uh, the adults, uh, you know, when, when the adults feed on the leaves in, in, in June, uh, after they feed for, uh, for a little bit. Um, Dinotefuran uh, can, is a little bit more water-soluble. It can kill first and second instar larvae. Uh, but we don't know about the the, the last in star larvae, but uh, just a few bites will kill the adults. Uh, Emamectin benzoate, uh, one or two bites will kill the adults. This is probably the most poisonous stuff to the beetles, and uh, it kills the first and second in star larvae, and it lasts a couple of years. Uh, the azadiractin is very different. It's a different kind of a compound. Uh, it uh, kills larvae when they molt. Uh, that's how it works. Uh, and it also reduces the fecundity of adults, but it doesn't kill the adults. So, so this is why uh, you, you, you have to make sure that you have the product in the tree at the right time uh, when, when, when you're using this thing. And, and for all these products, I can't emphasize enough, water is critical for carrying the pesticide. So that whether you're injecting the tree or you're putting it into the soil, you want to make sure there's a nice stream of water that's going you know, from the, from the roots up into the trees because that's the vehicle that carries these products into the leaves where they're doing the most good, either sterilizing or killing the adult beetles. And then uh, providing product into the cambial area so that they can actually kill um, uh, larvae that are feeding, small larvae that are feeding on the tree. Okay, so uh, another question that we got recently is that, you know, because uh, there's been a lot of talk about tree injections, people think that uh, trees have got to be injected with an insecticide uh, in order for them to be saved, and that's simply not the case. Um, one of the things, uh, you know, and I'll show you with this, one of these uh, studies that uh, Dan Herms of Ohio State did, these are comparing soil apply applications of imidacloprid. Uh, there's a couple of products, Merit and Zytec. Uh, in this study, he was comparing spring versus fall applications in different doses. But uh, one of the things he found that when he started his, his study, uh, in 2006, there was no visible signs of injury on any of the trees in the study. And these trees varied between uh, 14 to uh, 20 inches in, in, in diameter. And in the, after the first year, uh, we started seeing a, he started seeing a little bit of a canopy decline, a little thinning in the canopy. And then in 2008, uh, the control over here, the untreated, had about a 40% canopy thinning. And uh, most of the products were keeping things below uh, 30%. But when the, when the rubber hit the road, when there was 90% thinning, uh, we started seeing that, the, that when you use these, the imidacloprid products in the fall, okay, uh, they don't seem to work as well when you use the single rate application than when you apply it in the spring, either at a single rate application or, or, or double rate application or in the fall at a double rate application. This trend continued uh, when we had 100% um, de de uh, decline. Uh, the difference really gets a lot more stark and uh, all three of these products seem to be working quite of well. Then as the tree starts to heal itself, uh, the tree get look, starts looking better and better over time. So the take home point is soil applied products, a single rate in the springtime or a double rate in the fall can give you excellent control on trees up to 20 inches in diameter. So, uh, so f but, but these things have to be applied every single year. In, um, in a similar, uh, now there, uh, uh, 
uh, another product, uh, Safari, uh, which is the uh, Dinotefran product. Uh, these were treated as a basal trunk spray where they actually, you, 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 the material was actually applied onto, uh, was applied onto the trunk with a spray wand. Uh, and uh, they also compared a, a soil treatment as well, where it was actually just injected into the soil. And the trees varied between 8.5 dBH to 16.5 uh, inches uh, dBH. That's 6.5 inches diameter at, at breast height. And uh, what, the, what they found was that in, in, all, these, uh, the, all, in all these trials, uh, from between May 2008 and, and 2000, August of 2013, uh, damage was kept to be less than uh, 20%, and that in comparison to 78% uh, decline uh, with the control. So that shows that the stuff is working quite well. Um, another study was done with emamectin benzoate, uh, which is the, uh, the third type of product we were talking about. It was treated in 2006. And the idea is to see how long this product works. And we see, once again, this curve, which you see is we're very familiar with uh, as, the, as we go from 2006 to 100% uh, defoliation in 2010 on the untreated. We see that we have two years of excellent control uh, and even some pretty good control uh, at, at the low rate of this product, uh, you know, one, two, uh, three years af af after the application after the application. So if you apply in 2006, you can get one, two years of control at the very least, and maybe maybe even three. So this stuff lasts for a long time. And this was done on trees up to 25 inches in diameter. By This is done, again, by Dan Herms. So large trees can be uh, protected. Uh, there are studies uh, underway uh, where uh, on trees that are up to four foot in diameter, uh, and there's also lots of local reports that we're seeing in areas where emerald ash borer exists that they're actually able to protect trees by using emmectin benzoate. Uh, we're doing a study right now uh, where we're treating these trees were treated with emmectin benzoate. Uh, these trees were actually dying before the studies uh, got got started, but 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 just to show you, there's a lot of emerald ash borer pressure here. And two years into these things, I took this picture on August 20th. These ash trees are looking beautiful, even though they're trees dying. Uh, and these are very large trees, uh, uh, 40 inches in in diameter on some of these things. Uh, really big trees treated with emmectin benzoate. Uh, we've got another study going on. We're into year two of what's going to probably be a six-year study. Uh, we have trees that are with a DBH up to 48 inches. And uh, initially, you know, we didn't have much dieback the first year that we started this thing over here, less than 10%. But now we're still at less than 10% dieback when we're using with the triage and the arbormectin product. And uh, the control is at about 25%. So, so the early indications are that these products are protecting trees quite nicely, uh, even when they're very, very large in this controlled study. Okay, um, so a another question I think that, that, that people have often is that um, there's, a, there's a product that comes out that usually underbids, it's called the Wedgel Injection System. Uh, it's it's fairly attractive because you can probably apply the the, the product for a, a, a low amount. Uh, so uh, there was a study that was done that Dan uh, Dan Herms did uh, a few years ago, where we compare he compared Pointer, which is this uh, Wedgel product with triage and and Zytec. Uh, an infestation had already started, so that the initially there was about anywhere between 20 and 30 uh, percent. Um, uh, uh, canopy decline at the start and as you can see is that the uh, untreated trees and the pointer trees uh, all continue to decline quite drastically in two years whereas the Zytec and the triage products uh, these trees pretty much stayed the same so this is definitive evidence to show that uh, the this, this wedge system just simply does not deliver enough product to get the job done so uh, stay away from this uh, when you see this, when, when, if you see ads for these sorts of things. Uh, so, and, and stick with stuff that works, like either uh, imidacloprid, uh, dinotefuran, triage, or the uh, azadiractin. And once again, you know, you see the dead tree on the left. Okay, now, any questions you have about, um, about uh, the, um, 
insecticides can be found on uh, if you go to uh, emeraldashboard.info uh, you can download this bulletin this is the second edition we put it together uh, so it came out in uh, June of 2014 and it's got uh, summaries of all the research trials that have that were done to that point in time including the reason the rationale for how to use as a directin and um, you know that should be uh, your source for all inf all information. So if people have questions, you know, just refer to that. You can actually uh, print off pages uh, of that and show show your clients if they have any questions. Okay. Now, so now that we know we can control trees, we control control emerald ash borer, we can uh, protect trees. Uh, people say, well, that's great, but can uh, you know? But do we have to do this forever? Well, uh, when we were uh, at this meeting, uh, actually, Robin and I were at this meeting last last week uh, in uh, Ohio, and people were reviewing some work. And one of the things that 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 we we've always assumed was that the population of emerald ash borer really is going to change uh, after the initial wave of destruction. So uh, one, our colleague uh, Kathleen Knight has been studying populations of trees uh, in forests and populations of, of emerald ash borer in, in, in forests for a number of years, since 2007. And this green line over here present, uh, represents the number of living ash trees with a diameter at breast height of four inches or, 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 of, of, or greater. OK, that's what 10 centimeters is. And, uh, 2007, all the trees greater than 10 centimeters were alive and happy. Okay, 2008, they declined to about 90 percent. Uh, 2009, they're down to about 70. 50 percent in 2010, and by 2011, they were all dead. All right, so you know that that's the the object lesson is of course the emerald ash borer killed all the trees in that forest. But what I find really interesting is watching the population of EAB, which they monitored with, with, with a, uh, a baited trap. And uh, so they had about, uh, and this is, they had about uh, 50 per trap in uh, 2008. They had 120 per trap in uh, 2009. And then when half the trees were dying, uh, were, were already dead, they had um, uh, 160 per trap. But then in the next year, when all the trees had died, when they had finished dying, they had uh, they had uh, about uh, 20 trees per trap. So they had about a great about an 80 percent decline in 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 that year, and then it continues to decline to close to zero by 2014. So that tells me, uh, with, with you know, this is great evidence to suggest that the pressure for continuing managing EAB in areas where all the trees have essentially been killed, except for the ones treated with insecticide, is really going to change after that initial wave of mortality. And I want to thank Kathleen Knight uh, for sharing this uh, unpublished uh, uh, data uh, for today's presentation. So one of the things that, 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 that I developed, my group has developed, is this uh, uh, Tool called the Emerald Ash Borer Cost Calculator, and 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 what we do, it's based on this model of this invasion wave model. And what I've done is I've taken this information from Kathleen, and I've actually modified the model that I use uh, to predict uh, what's going to be happening. And, and so what I've got is I've got two curves here. The um, I know too many graphs, but uh, this y-axis refers to the per, per, uh, percentage of the maximum of the highest amount of, of, of either the number of beetles that you're going to be flying in the area or the number of ash trees that are that are dying okay and you know what I assume is that the number of trees that are dying doubles every year you know from 1 to 8 16 32 64 to 100 percent over an eight-year period okay I mean you know, over, over this is the number of trees that, that, that are dying over over, over an eight-year period and uh, so the population, based on Kathleen model, model, will peak the year before the trees die, and then when the trees start, when they're all dead, uh, you know, there's uh, about uh, only 20% of the initial population of emerald ash borer, and then that goes down for a period of time, and then, uh, you know, given time, it eventually will start trickling back, back back up again. So what I'd like to think of is I'd like to think of the first eight years here when EAB populations are building and trees are starting to die as the aggressive maintenance phase. So there is you want to go with what you want to use as much insecticide as you possibly can to protect these trees. And then after the population 
crashes and there are very few emerald ash borer around you can go into a maintenance mode and only start treating when you start seeing symptoms again because a lot of these products uh, especially the emamectin benzoate can really protect can protect trees that already have had some injury uh, the uh, amid, the uh, imidacloprid uh, can uh, also uh, and the dinotiferin can also do this thing but they're they're much more they're most effective on trees with less than 25% thinning, whereas uh, the emamectin benzoate weight is better on trees that are greater than, with less than 50% thinning. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so the next uh, slide. So, so this is actually uh, some you know, evidence to suggest that these, that what to expect in cities, you know, uh, in cities, you know, this is data from my colleague, uh, Chad Tinkle, who's a city uh, arborist, in uh, Fort Wayne, and these this is the actual data of the trees that were uh, of the dead ash trees that they found. Uh, ash uh, in uh, Fort Wayne, uh, they had 14,000 ash trees. It was discovered in, in 2006, and by 2014, all the ash trees are are gone. Okay, so uh, the population, you know, initially they had just a few. Uh, you know, uh, trees that were being removed over time, but then the population, the death curve just skyrocketed, and then the, they had just huge costs uh, to keep up with this thing. So, you know, you know, you can the first four years you can keep up with the removals, but the next four years, 80% of the trees die, and there's no way you can you can keep up with you know, re with removing you know 3,500 trees a year when you know unless you hire a lot of people in, and that's that's very very expensive. Okay, so now, so so the other thing, the method I'm thinking about right now, that people are thinking, well, gosh, how much is this stuff going to actually going to actually cost? And so what I've done with this cost calculator is, is, is I, I've taken a uh, 1,500 tree forest, and uh, it's it's a makeup forest. So and this this number corresponds to one to three inch dbh three to six, six to 12, and so on with these categories as we go along. And this is sort of the distribution of the, of, of the size of, of, of the trees that are in this makeup city over here. And uh, what I want to do is compare what it costs over time to uh, replace the unsafe ash as they die using that that, that that death curve, okay, that we that we, I, I showed you earlier, uh, replacing all ash over an eight-year period, uh, treat uh, the best 80% and replace the rest over over an eight-year period, and uh, my assumption is uh, is that it's going to cost ten dollars per inch for triage injections that will have to be put in every two years, or or, or arbormectin injections to put in every two years, and that during the aggressive phase it'll be done every two years, and then the maintenance phase will kick that back to twice the rate every four years. Uh, treatments will save 95% of the trees, and the annual mortality, as most of these models go, uh, will be about two percent. Uh, the replacement tree will will be a two and a half inch DBH tree, which will cost four hundred dollars to purchase, plant, and stake. Uh, and the cost of removing and stump grinding are are, are figures that I got from the city arborist in uh, in, in Indianapolis. Okay, as and, and these are uh, re, uh, pretty much uh, the going rate in the city. And what I've done is I've uh, in this first graph over here is I'm comparing. The red, the 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 black line here is the cost of removing the trees as they die, okay, and this this uh, red line is removing the trees proactively over a period of time, and then these this blue line over here is the cost of removal and replacement of uh, for, for for all these trees uh, over uh, uh, over the, the point of the simulation. And what you see is in the early part, during the aggressive period, okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Okay, can everybody? Okay, yep. can you, you know. hear me? I somehow you, you age there. Great, good. Okay, good. <laughs> You're there. Okay. 
Uh, I'm back. All right. Where was I? Okay. So, um, well, what, what I what I did was I was going through this uh, aggressive period, and 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 you can see that uh, that uh, if you you treat your 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 trees, your peak cost is going to be a lot less than it would be if you just let nature take its course. Okay. These are just annual costs each year. Cumulatively, however. Uh, the cost of treating 80% of your trees is going to be a lot more than it would be to just remove and replace all your trees. All right. So people armed with this decision are often armed with this information are making the decision that it just makes more sense to just get rid of the trees and try to save them, and then we'll have new new trees without this problem. Well. Um, there, there, there's a problem with with this kind of analysis, and, and the problem is is that you know the, the, this this price of about ten dollars per inch, okay, is probably what happens when you call early in the invasion cycle, when uh, you know you know you, you, you uh, a city arborist might might call up a, a a place and say, look, you know, how much would would you would you uh, would you charge to treat the trees, and the, the, it's new to the area, and you're going to get costs uh, somewhere uh, between, you know, somewhere in, in in the ten dollar range. What we did is we actually surveyed uh, cities in in the Midwest that have been experiencing emerald ash borer, and we we looked at, all, at at a lot of municipal bids, and we found that when the bid size, when the number of trees that were bid on were less than a hundred trees, it kind of varied all over the place, anywhere from twelve dollars per inch down to about four dollars per inch but once we got greater than a hundred trees per bid uh, it varies between four and five dollars per inch so um, what I thought I would do is take this information plug it into the model okay uh, and, and assume that rather than treating for ten dollars an inch it's going to cost four dollars and thirty five cents an inch which is an actual bid that a city had uh, that we surveyed had and then run the numbers and see what happens and now we see something much much more pleasant. We see that it costs a little bit less or about the same to uh, treat Cliff, we lost you again. Can you come back on? I made you a presenter again. Leo, okay, great. Yeah. Can you hear me now? There you okay. go. Okay, all right. Yep. Okay, okay. It's a good thing I've thought this through. This would this would drive me nuts. <laughs> okay, all right. So here we are. So 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 let's say uh, so this is uh, so now. If you use the more realistic price of four dollars and thirty-five cents of uh, per inch applied every two years, you'll see by this green arrow that, the, that that after twenty-five years the costs are about the same, and your annual costs are just a lot lower, okay, than either the cumulative, uh, than either proactively removing these things or letting the trees, uh, removing the trees as they die. Okay, so when you use more realistic numbers, now it makes a lot more sense to actually save the trees. And when you when you save 80% of the trees, you know you've got a lot. You actually have a lot more trees, this blue line, than you would have had had you replaced all your trees. And uh, you know, if you had had you re had you replaced all all, all all your trees. So uh, so this is the so so uh, the take home point is is that you know saving these trees makes uh, economic sense. Uh, it it's, uh, costs you less on an annual basis. It costs you less in the long term and in just cash outlay. And you wind up with a bigger forest. Now, what if you delay? Okay, If you're, if, 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 if you're delaying, uh, you know, the, the cost calculator allows you to uh, enter in simulations uh, uh, at various points in the invasion wave based on this uh, uh, doubling curve that, that, that we use and uh, what we find is that if you start it at year one okay um, you know to, to control this is you, you would your, your peak costs your peak costs uh, if you let them uh, as they if you let if you remove them as they die would be about three hundred and eighty thousand dollars as opposed to a hundred and sixty two thousand dollars for preemptive removal and $131,000 for, for spraying. But as you decrease the amount of time, you know, as you 
start your treaty later in the cycle, you start compressing these costs, costs and your annual costs get higher. So instead of being 378, you're up at 401,000. But if you start at year six, you know, you're, almost, you're at $580,000 to remove them as, 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 as they go. And this is a really bad situation to be in because I am not sure that at year six, when 32% of the trees are showing damage, uh, that, that, that there are very many trees that, are, are, that you could save uh, that late in, 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 into the game. But if you start early, Okay, even as late as four years into the cycle, when one when eight percent of the of the ash trees are showing damage, which is basically one out of twelve trees, uh, you know, uh, start you know, dying. Uh, you you can you can have you can have some great great success. So, my summary of these mismatched expectations is that you know there's a delay between the the first detection of emerald ash borer in, in the area and, and tree decline and you know so what happens is to say you know say in 2010 the emerald ash borer is first found in an area uh, 2000 and and it gets a lot of press in 2011 and 2012 and there's really you know not a whole lot of dying trees until uh, probably about maybe 2014 and so by the time the damage occurs people forgot about the whole message and people you know uh, uh, you know are, are after several years of not seeing EAB after they heard about it they think there's going to be a big problem and and they, they, they think that it's a lot of hooey and that somebody's just uh, they think that the EAB is less important than it really winds up to be and it really sort of sneaks up and gets them uh, the other thing is that you know people uh, th thought that EAB population uh, would 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 be high over over time, uh, and that they would need to be continually be controlled at the same rate, and and that's just not true, and that that tends to overestimate the costs, and then also when you use low numbers of trees to get estimates for uh, EAB treatment costs, it inflates the costs, and it biases the decision to think that tree removal is more economical than tree protection, which is simply not true. So how do you choose the best 80% of trees to save? You want to make sure they're structurally sound and there's enough of the healthy tree remaining so that you, you can save it. And then, of course, it's in the right place. And just to dramatize that, we've got uh, uh, this decision guide, which is available at uh, eabindiana.info. It's also available at the Emerald Ash Borer. Uh, dot info uh, where we, this is a nice little guide to sort of guide you to how to make decisions uh, you know like starting off with you know do you want to save your trees uh, and you you can hire how to hire a tree care professional and and go through this the whole season over there so you know you want to avoid investing your dollars on trees that are unbalanced like this one that are going to fall over for other reasons uh, you know trees that that you know we could probably protect what's left of this tree but there's not much left of this tree that's worth saving and uh you know power lines you know you don't you know i think typically this tree shouldn't be under this power line so it might not be worth investing your money into it and of course you know uh when there's just no tree lawn uh these trees are going to die anyway so don't 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 waste your money trying to trying to save uh, 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 these sorts of trees. Okay, well, you know, so the question is, how do you get pe pe people moving? Uh, I guess somebody said, uh, you know, how, how do you get people uh, moving? Um, the um, we got this program called Neighbors Against Bad Bugs. It's called tree tagging. It gets people. Uh, Uh, interested in uh, in the problem before the problem uh, before the trees get too far gone, and uh, one community in Greenwood, Indiana, has been tr has sort of got our message early in the game, and they've been treating since 2007 with soil drenches of imidacloprid. They were tr they had 600 ash trees. Uh, there were 22 homeowners, and each homeowner pays $54 a year for an annual uh, imidacloprid soil drench that's done by a professional. And at the end of 12 years, uh, they'll be, have spent $648 a tree, and uh, their trees will be alive, and the trees would be about 15 inches in diameter. This is this is in contrast with uh, had they decided to remove and replace, 
it would have cost them six hundred dollars per tree. And after the years, they would, instead of having twelve inch, uh, fifteen inch DBH trees, they would have had twelve inch DBH trees. So clearly, here's a situation where somebody getting on in the game early in the in, in the game. Uh, for a very modest cost of $54 per homeowner per year are able to preserve the integrity of the neighborhood which is largely lined with uh, ash trees. Uh, I actually used, I actually ran their numbers in, in, into the cost calculator and I found that you know lo and behold yes it was more economical for them to save their trees rather than removing and, and, and replacing them. Okay so okay um, so the, the last uh, myth that I wanted to talk about was about uh, uh, treating ash, that uh, treating ash for EAB will kill pollinators. Uh, there's been a lot of, 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 of press these days uh, about, about the use of neonicotinoids uh, and the use of insecticides and colony collapse disorder and, and the like. Um, Turns out that uh, you know, f first of all, uh, uh, these insecticides that we use can definitely kill bees when bees are exposed. But ash trees are pollinated by the wind, and that bees do not bees do n are not attracted to the ash flowers, and they just generally do not forage on there. There is a a, a link. Uh, that's on eabindiana.info as well as this particular one over here on side effects, potential side effects of, in, of, of these insecticides where a lot of the data are reviewed. But basically, it's, it's just simply not, not a risk. So, um, so what I'm saying, and you've got to be very clear here because if you, you know, uh, when people ask you questions about uh, neonicotinoids and bee safety, uh, if you start off your discussion by saying neonicotinoids do not kill bees, they'll stop listening because that's simply not true. These products, neonicotinoids, emamectin, benzoate, will kill bees, but they won't kill bees when they're applied in trees to control emerald ash borer. So, and, and there's just no data suggesting that they actually do. So, uh, so, so that that's uh, that. So that is really the last myth I think that I wanted to talk about. And, and at this point, I can start um, answering some questions. OK. Well, the first one here was uh, Louise Levy. Please clarify what year one and year four mean in, in the simulations. And uh, what, I, what I did with those things is year one refers to when you're driving around and only 1% of the trees are, are lost. Uh, year four is when. 8% of the trees are, are damaged to the point that they have to be taken down, okay? So, uh, and then, uh, so that's what the years, that, that's what these years are. Now, the other question was asked by, um, okay, okay, uh, Bay Reynoso uh, over here says, isn't the issue that a lack of species diversity leads to increased ash costs? And, uh, Yes, I, I think that there's there, you know, if you have a, a city that ha, that is 80% ash trees, uh, probably, uh, you know, this might be a time where you might want to consider diversifying your trees. Uh, you may not want to save 80% of the ash trees, but if you're only talking about 20% of the ash tree of the trees being ash, uh, and you're saving 80% of that, you know, you I think the balance is is there, you know, so. Uh, so that's something that you, you could think about. But you know, it, uh, you can diversify trees at your leisure, um, but you can't protect.